Hello, everyone. Welcome to our May Endres All Hands meeting. We're going to start with our working group update, and then we have three deep dives on data transfer, auto retrieve, and Lotus. As a reminder, we're one of many uh, research and engineering teams in the Protocol Labs network where we drive breakthroughs in computing technology to push humanity forward. Um, we really believe that the internet is very core to the work we're doing and building it on top of uh, core content addressing primitives in Web3 is a way to make um, all of the amazing discoveries and work that's happening over the, the next couple of decades um, grow on a foundation that is resilient, empowering of human agency, um, and going to set us up for lots of future success. Um, we currently do that, um, mostly focused on th these kind of set of core projects, especially IPFS, LibP2P, and Filecoin, but there's many other core building blocks to that as well. Um, and our working group mission is to scale and unlock new opportunities for IPFS, Filecoin, and LibP2P. Um, and we do that in some critical ways by growing the network, by driving breakthroughs uh, in network protocol and stack, uh, and also scaling the development and research happening across this network, um, both personally and by participating in the wider um, ecosystem and helping it grow. This is our set of core Endres working groups. Um, we are growing these every single day. Um, if you are excited about the work you hear about here, we are looking for awesome new humans um, and we have a number of open roles. So please uh, join us on this, this link and we would be very excited to talk to you um, and see how we can collaborate on uh, pushing this work forward. Our strategy for 2022 is focused on kind of these four areas. First, growing the, the talent funnel of amazing humans um, contributing to kind of the, the PL network stack and all of the um, kind of like projects and protocols that, that we support, especially around IPVS, Falcon, the P2P. Um, we have a vast majority of the team that's focusing on making IPFS and Filecoin robust uh, storage and retrieval networks and driving a lot of uh, kind of adoption and growth and um, robustness there. Um, we also have a number of really exciting kind of like research and engineering breakthroughs around programmability, scalability, and compute that are in the works right now. Um, and finally, we do all of this with a first and foremost focus on making sure that these networks continue to operate smoothly, putting out um, kind of like new core protocol releases, burning down tech debt, and making sure that, that we can upgrade and, um, and push these things forward uh, securely. Quick view into some, some items, some exciting milestones that, that folks are working towards in various different working groups. Um, there's been a ton of work happening on petabyte level onboarding onto uh, Filecoin. Uh, the data programs team has been doing a ton of work, has crossed one petabyte a day um, uh, that we want to make sure this is maintained and consistent going forward. Um, the Bedrock team has been doing a ton of work on IPFS Filecoin interop, um, launching the network indexers, um, setting up auto retrieve as a bridge between um, requests in IPFS and requests to storage providers. Um, there's a lot of work happening around retrieval markets to enable kind of fast uh, CDN level retrieval of data across um, the IPFS and Filecoin networks. The retrieval markets working groups pushing on that. Um, the FVM team is pushing uh, to, to first land FVM M1 and then drive towards unlocking user programmability in FVM M2. Um, the CryptoNet team has a really exciting uh, MVP that's actually already up on Ethereum testnet around a Falcon retrievability oracle that can um, add additional kind of like retrieval uh, uh, guarantees there. Um, and then the Consensus Lab team is doing some really, really amazing work toward making sure that we have the scalable chain space for all of the exciting work coming out of, uh, of FEM and CryptoNet and, and other teams so that we can uh, have the, the consensus space to um, have all of those transactions. Um, and so please check out our public notion if you want to learn more about any of these projects. All of these teams are doing weekly set reps so you can see the, the latest um, from each of them as these milestones uh, come closer. And now handing it off to Adine for IPFS. So IPFS, uh, we're trying to make uh, the web more peer-to-peer -peer with content addressing. And the network still seems to be, be doing its thing. Uh, we have nodes, people use them, they get more nodes. Uh, content routing is, is uh, still doing fine. Still under half a second for, for finding latencies. We can, we can keep going down for that, but for the DHT, that seems where we're at right now. We've had many open and closed PRs this, uh, this month, uh, and it's more to do. On Friday, we had an IPFS implementers workshop, which I'll be talking about uh, later in this call, which is very exciting. Uh, 
talking with people uh, across the ecosystem who are working on IPFS implementations. Uh, Go IPFS uh, 013 RC1 is out. Uh, the amount of changes was so big, it did not fit in the GitHub UI. It, it broke. Um, some big changes that people will like include libp2p resource management, which has been, I think, you know, five or so years on the request log, and having hole punching uh, that works by default, uh, which is also quite a number of years in the making. Um, big thanks to the libp2p folks for that. And, and gateway API changes and improvements. Uh, the reframe spec uh, has been implemented. It is in the hydras and it is in the development indexers, uh, which leads us to have lots of cool options around how we do delegated routing. Um, and more, more on that will be forthcoming. And some of you may have seen, uh, there is an IPFS collab with uh, Lockheed Martin on seeing how we can send IPFS to space. The major theme of things upcoming is how we support more implementations. Uh, there are many, they show up all the time. Yesterday, Jeremy pushed one up called YPFS. It, it does things, it works for, for large storage, for you know, larger storage nodes and has different sorts of requirements that might be needed from something like YPFS. And enabling everyone else through things like specs, uh, things like delegated routing, three frame. Uh, and for those interested, we'll be renaming, uh, Go, we're working on renaming Go IPFS. Uh, there's an issue in the Go IPFS repo. So suggest a name, suggest a good name, suggest a troll name. If you don't suggest good names, we're going to go with banana. So suggest a good name. All right. Awesome. Over to Alex. Hi. So uh, in the JS IP stack, what's been going on? Well, since our last, uh, since, since we were last all together, um, we shipped uh, JS Lib P2P 37. The notable feature there being it's now ESM only. Uh, and the whole thing is written in TypeScript, which gives us uh, a lot more safety as developers. And generally, I just had nicer experience, but there are practical benefits as well. Not that those aren't practical. Um, the bundle is now smaller. It's 137K down from 180 uh, because we now don't use a bunch of uh, dependencies because we have, you know, we managed to drop things like big number because there is big int in uh, JavaScript, which we now use natively. Uh, that kind of thing, which is really quite exciting. Um, we also, you'll see the graph on the right. So that's quite nice. There's been a, uh, a very long running uh, problem with uh, libp2p and JS where um, over time it just eats all the memory. So that's the graph on the left and the graph on the right is the after, um, which you can see looks a lot better. Uh, which, you know, is a, a very much way off my mind. I'm very happy uh, about that. So, uh, yeah, cool. Uh, also ships 37.1, which, uh, yeah, just tidies up a few little extra things around the, around the edge of 37. So you should upgrade as soon as possible. It's very, very good. Uh, and please tell us the things that are bad. So far, no one has told us anything is bad. Therefore, it is all good. So you should totally upgrade. Yes, please. Uh, next. Coming up uh, is uh, th those versions of libp2p rolled up to IPFS. Um, it's ready to go. Uh, it's the end of the day here, and it's Friday tomorrow. Never ship anything on a Friday, so that's going out first thing Monday morning. Um, it is also ESM only uh, because that's what happens when you go ESM only. This just uh, yeah, it leaks everywhere. Um, but it's the future. You should never be using uh, CJS anymore because. ESM is the module system in JavaScript. Everything else is a hack. Just lay it on top, user space. Uh, anyway, ESM is the way forward. Um, yeah, so it's now ESM only in JSIPFS as well. Uh, we have like lightweight peer ID. So this is very exciting. So um, the peer ID module uh, up until this point has dragged a lot of crypto dependencies with it. So implementations of all the algorithms that we use that are not available in web crypto, which makes it incredibly heavyweight. And, completely unsuitable for use in the browser, for example, where you're generally not doing any of these cryptographic operations. The new version does not have any of this baggage, um, which is wonderful, because it means that we can now have a proper pair ID type and we don't have to have everything as strings, um, which is, you know, pretty tedious and completely counter to this whole, let's, let's have types for things. Uh, and yeah, so what else? So the next version of libp2p is going to have a resource manager, very similar to the one shipped in uh, Go libp2p recently. Um, Yamux is going to arrive and Circuit Relay v2. And just a massive thanks to everyone who's helped uh, pull this across the line, particularly the people at Chainsafe, uh, who've done a wonderful job uh, reviewing my, whatever it is, 500 odd PRs. Uh, 
they were very patient, very patient, very uh, kind with the with the approved button. So thank you very much uh, to them, and just to generally to everyone who's who's helped out uh, with you know contributions from the community and and all that collab. So yeah, that's it. Happy jazz. Awesome. Congrats on the releases. Exciting. Moving on to libp2p. Hello everyone. Libp2p is the networking library for peer-to-peer -peer protocol development. So let's look at uh, some updates from this last month. Uh, so go lib p 2 p we've been consolidating repos furiously. Uh, and so now we have a bunch of flaky tests. The tests that were flaky that wouldn't run very often are now running on every go lib p 2 p commit. Um, so this graph here shows you tests that failed, but then when you click the retry button with no changes in code, they worked. Uh, and the bigger the circle, the more times you had to retry before they worked. Um, it was especially bad at the beginning. Uh, we still have like quite a bit of flakes uh, and we're committed to fixing them. So expect this graph to look better uh, next, next month. Um, and overall, the nodes in the network have held pretty steady. So uh, last month was P2P Paris. We have the videos now of those presentations. Uh, there's the long-term view by Juan, which is really good. Uh, and there's also a link here to the playlist. Uh, I especially recommend checking out Martin's quick deep deep dive. Uh, that was really good and made me really excited for quick. Um, we had some community calls uh, with the community and someone presented Swift Lib P2P, which is quite cool. And I would recommend checking it out. Um, for some technical updates, we have now a uh, draft spec and proof of concept for web transport, which is basically like quick in the browser. And this allows uh, browser nodes to connect directly to any lib P2P server without them having like a you know valid blessed uh, certificate. Um, and then WebRTC is another path that allows this. So we have WebRTC in the browser, where this is going to be to implement this server side. And so again, this will allow any browser to connect to any lib P2P server. Uh, and what's especially exciting about these two paths is that uh, this coupled with like relays will allow any browser to connect to any other browser um, without like a dedicated centralized uh, server. So they'll be able to use any relay server and create a direct peer-to-peer uh, -peer connection to any other browser. So that will be huge when that works. Um, Go to P2P released a new version and it's uh, just a consolidation uh, release. Um, and we have some updates in Rustle P2P coming out, which will be, which these two updates are net negative code. So that's uh, that's really exciting. And uh, yeah, to help help pave the way for a uh, quick in Rustle P2P. That's it from uh, the P2P side. Woohoo. Over to IPLD. Rod will be giving us an update. IPLD highlights. So despite uh, losing Daniel and um, Eric having a well-earned break, IPLD development continues. Uh, we have been working on a lot on BindNode recently. Now BindNode is part of GoIPLD Prime. Uh, it is a uh, interaction mode with a GoIPLD Prime that we are focusing on because it makes working with Go types a lot easier. Um, it is currently used in the latest, latest Go Graph Sync and Go Data Transfer, and we're working through Go Fill Markets. When we get that full stack, it out, then uh, we get to use some of the power of Go IPLD Prime throughout that, and we simplify a lot of code. There's a lot of complexity in there to do with IPLD that we get to throw out. Um, we're also adding support for custom type conversions for complicated situations like token amount and address and signature, which are all in Filecoin. These are these are uh, encoded as byte arrays, but they have these complex structures and rules around them. So adding in support for dealing with those in bind node allows us to do things like work with types that are also using Seaboard Gen. So you can use Seaboard Gen and Binode at the same time, and you get the benefits of both for whichever situation you want. So this is also used for, uh, useful for migrations and testing. So this is, um, this is going full steam ahead. Other things that are going on, um, we've improved Go IPLD Prime's IPLD schema DSL parser. It's close to complete, close to language complete. Um, just a few things left off that are fairly low priority. Uh, the um, FVM team, uh, and in particular Volca, have been working on the Rust DAG Seaboard codec implementation. It's got full spec compliance now. It's passing all our test fixtures. 
Uh, JavaScript's car library has had a couple of updates. It's got uh, now car v2 read support. And thanks to the dot storage team and Iraqli in particular, it's there's a new car buffered writer for sync in memory car creation because they're doing some really interesting things with small cars and using cars as a transport in uh, in memory through the browser. So check that out. Uh, opportunities uh, for you. There's a very active public sync and chat every two weeks that happens um, across the PL network. Bunch of people doing interesting things. You can join via Zoom to join in and chat. Um, it's, pr it's pretty free form, um, or you can watch it live on YouTube. Details are on GitHub. Um, we're also continuing to evolve by, by Node and would be interested to hear about other use cases um, so that we can test it and, and push its limits. And that's it for IPLD for this, this week. I think I'll jump in here next. Molly, just want to quickly talk on the uh, developers IPLD. team. Yeah, so we've been really trying to shore up our operational security, particularly around GitHub. There's kind of years of technical uh, debt in terms of who has access to what repos, et cetera. And so we are getting all of GitHub management into code it's into GitHub itself so that you can see, a, you can create a PR to give people access. You can see the commit history and uh, we have better auditing, et cetera, on that. So that the whole system has been built out. Uh, it's been rolled out to many of our repos. So. Uh, in future, the, the desired state to get to is if you want to have access to something, you create a PR and the relevant pr uh, provers can uh, review it and get it merged and then an automatic workflow um, is executed that gives permissions. Um, so that, like I said, has been deployed a lot of places. We haven't uh, tightened down the hatches many places yet. Um, we're starting with libp2p, so you might start getting notifications of, hey, you're about to lose access. These aren't one-way doors. We'd rather get things tightened and then add people back in as necessary. So that's underway. There's a, you know, a lot of the team is focused on working on test ground right now with Bloxico, getting us to a place of uh, stability in the test infrastructure so we can do, um, you know, implement, we can do compatibility testing and uh, performance testing and particularly focused on libp2p first. Um, so we'll have more to share on that, uh, the next all hands update. And the other thing we just wanted to flag is the team is working on using uh, self-hosted GitHub uh, actions for more reliable uh, CI setup. So if that would be of use to your team in any way, please reach out to the IPDX team. They're very responsive in Discord. They've got office hours, et cetera, and are just really here to help people be more productive. Thanks. Awesome, great to hear. Over to Filecoin, Jennifer. Well, Filecoin, we're trying to build a decentralized storage network for the most important like humanity information. So as you all can see, the network total storage capacity is steadily growing. We are at almost like the big 17 exabytes um, for quality adjusted power. So that's very exciting. A lot of those are contributed by the data program for onboarding real data into the storage network. Uh, for today, we are hitting 90.5. 56 pbytes, uh, which is like 20 pbytes uh, increase from like colossal hands, which is like incredible. As you guys can see, we're at 0.64 uh, pbytes like per day at growth. Uh, a lot of this is thanks to Falcon Plus team and Evergreen, uh, which is all very exciting that you see the network is actually being used for the real data. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so for the Filecoin highlights, you probably have heard of it and you are going to keep hearing it for the rest of the year. FEM, we have been talking about it forever. However, we're finally so, 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 so close to actually shipping uh, FEM M1 into the Filecoin network. Uh, as of last Thursday, uh, the reference implementation of FEM T, uh, F VM has been feature free, so we have the RC tag out already. And before you know the network upgrade, we will be in the more audits and bug fixing mode. Uh, in parallel, we can never, you know, only working on one single thread. So we are already started to scoping out FVM M2 uh, scope. So for, for those who doesn't know, M2 is about in unblock uh, user programmability. So user smart contract into the file coin, uh, which will uh, definitely enable more use case onto the file coin network. Uh, as those are uh, scoping out, we are also working with FVM early builders to building like the tooling SDKs, test nets, and all those things that can improve smart contract or that developers as M2 launches later this year. Uh, 
Along with CFVM, uh, we are still working on the built-in actor. So for the network upgrade as uh, V16, we are going to be switching from the spec actor, which is ready, ready in Go, um, to built-in actor, which is uh, ready in Rust. Uh, so for this big switch, a lot of like test coverage really is ongoing. Huge shout out to Zen. Um, he, he has been amazing and leading this effort with the Forest team, another implementation team in the network uh, to help us uh, cover the whole code base and ensure the switch is safe and secure to land in the Falcon network. As for Lotus, we are the shipping ship. So we are working with all these teams very closely and getting ready for the NV16 upgrade. So we are going to call Future Freeze actually tomorrow and having the tag and deploy that on butterfly so that we can start to test with the community for the first time uh on fvm uh, a couple of the, the opportunities again now with v17 come uh v16 uh coming in june and july uh later in june early in july we will see how the development goes uh, the bug bounty is still open we we welcome everyone just to help us like you know further out the code Again, it's a big change to the system. A lot of work is being done by early builders. Ali is gonna give us an amazing update later. Uh, for uh, for like the Falcon in general, it's like Forest team has been growing a lot and actually have been stepping up a lot on building act, uh, actor like effort. So with the in joining this, uh, we can have like more resources developing different protocols in the future. So we're super looking forward to that. Katie from the Falcon Foundation, the TPM, uh, the governance TPM, she started a new FRC Falcon request of comments proposal so that we can uh, have a governance process for things that's not consensus critical, but also like good to have a standard for the Falcon protocol that will be including like markets, uh, API standard and all those things. We are still looking for feedback. So if you have any thoughts, uh, click on the link and help us review the process. And again, we have to work in parallel, moving fast on Falcon. So the core devs has started to plan out what the next network upgrade should be. Uh, so if you are curious what's being proposed, uh, click that link as well. And uh, that will be maybe one or two upgrade before FEM M2, we'll see. Awesome, thank you, Jennifer. Over to Jesse for NetOps. I think NetOps, uh, we're still checking our TTFP for the 95 percentile. Uh, you know, still around the 10 second, it's still putting pretty well. Uh, our IPFS cluster ping out low is increased to 346 million pings uh, that uh, have like 10% increase from last time we checked. Uh, our weekly IPS, uh, IPFS IO gateway request is still increasing to around uh, 955 million requests. A unified IPFS uh, IO gateway user is uh, 8.2 million. So a lot of the uh, numbers still very stable. A lot of usage is still increasing, uh, but our networking uptime is still pretty good. Okay. <laughs> The DRAN uh, API uh, chain love, a Sentinel, uh, file info, and IPFS bootstrap, always a uh, 100%. Uh, the IPFS uh, IO gateway, we have like three nine, not five nine, but we try to uh, it reach like maybe four nine and then five nine. Um, I think that's uh, from the high level point of view from the uh, NetOps API. Awesome. And an update from Yanis on DRAN. Hello, hello, everyone. Um, quick update uh, with a lot of new things, actually. Uh, so um, we do have a new shiny monitoring dashboard for the resharing ceremonies. So if you've been in a DRAN ceremony before, you would have noticed that there is lots of um, manual kind of communication and back and forth with every partner to make sure that everything is in place before uh, actually executing the uh, resharing and the, the DKG. Now, thanks to Mario's great work, we do have a uh, monitoring dashboard that informs us of many of the things that we didn't know before and had to go and figure out like uh, by contacting partners. That would be, you know, if they upgraded the latest version of DRAND, um, you can see a screenshot at the top, which shows a very small part of the connectivity map, but you can think of that as, a, you know, um, every partner is both um, on the X and Y axis. And you can see if there is a transient failure, then this needs to be uh, figured out before the ceremony. Uh, if everything is good, it's green and so on. Uh, so that, that gives us much 
more kind of confidence for everything. Uh, in the screenshot at the bottom, you can see, you know, uh, the group size, what the threshold, uh, if some nodes are falling behind in terms of following uh, the latest um, randomness and so on. So uh, that was great news. And we used that for uh, spinning up a new network on testnet, which includes the new features that I have talked about before. Uh, so the new network is unchained, randomness is unchained, and the frequency of producing randomness is three seconds. Uh, so that was, um, yeah, a test, it's testnet, but um, it was successful, it was great. Uh, we now have a kind of, um, if I can put it that way, a second network running kind of virtually together with the first one, the default testnet that um, was not affected by any of that. We had a couple of hiccups with um, uh, unchained testnet that we fixed um, quickly. Uh, but yeah, that, that is great news because it takes uh, it can take the run to a next level. We have unchained randomness, so we can build time lock encryption on top, uh, but also run more networks um, with different nodes, um, non-LOE nodes, and, and so on and so forth. So um, we have uh, we can have a devnet into testnet. It's it's great. You can, we can do lots of things. Uh, eventually, Filecoin will uh, probably want to transition to that. So we started an initial initial discussion with. Um, uh, field dev team, but this uh, lot of work still needs to be done. Uh, we won't expect any of that before the end of the year. Um, but yeah, get involved. Uh, in terms of opportunities, we have um, yeah, we're doing a big push to get the word out about Dirand uh, with blog posts and several public talks. Uh, Yolan is pushing uh, for that, and uh, he's actually out on a um, on a conference. Uh, well, was last week. So great stuff there. Um, as I mentioned, time lock encryption is something that we want to develop clients for. It's a great use case for DRAND. Um, it can be used by different blockchains for several uh, other reasons. And um, yeah, looking forward to have that landing. Um, we do want to provide some funds to LOE operators uh, because, you know, providing randomness is a public good, as we all know. Uh, so uh, working on that again, um, later quarters, we'll have an update. Uh, it's just a, a shout out here. And where to find us? We moved out of PL Slack. There is a Deerun workspace. You can join if you want. We'll be inviting the community as well, like the users that um, uh, are building on DRAND and using DRAND. So great stuff there. And I've linked to the public page and roadmap as well as our uh, internal page with weekly updates. Uh, so click on those links or get in touch if you want to be added um, to follow what we're doing. Thank you very much. Awesome. David Choi. As far as KPIs go, uh, NFT storage has crossed 65 million uploads. So seeing steady growth still there um, and uh, notice that the amount of data, the volume of data being uploaded to Filecoin is also increasing. So speaks to potentially larger drops and that sort of thing. Web3 storage saw some acceleration in growth there kind of organically as well um, as the team looks to uh, focus more on growing that side of the product. Um, as far as highlights go, uh, one big update is that we are really digging into testing Elastic IPFS to be able to use it in production um, and kind of at first roll it out as a redundant layer to cluster, eventually, you know, being uh, able to rely on it as the, the primary write layer um, for, for our products and uh, a lot of good news there. Um, thanks, Alan and Bengo for instrumenting a lot of that testing, but very few connection errors, uh, bit swap errors are really low, being able to retrieve pretty much everything that uh, we know is in S3 um, and usable read speeds for the most part. Uh, there are some gaps still that we're working with the near form team to, to bridge, um, but, uh, and, uh, you know, one big thing that uh, effort that has been collaborative across all of NTRES has been being able to get uh, Elastic IPFS records onto the DHT. So um, huge shout out to all those who have been involved with that and will, um, but we're starting to see records from Elastic IPFS on the DHT. So seeing that percentage climb from zero uh, slowly up. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's super exciting. And, um, you know, like we're looking forward to having a example of another IPFS implementation in production. We released the super hot uh, gateway yesterday uh, for NFT.Storage's gateway. Uh, we now have a way to permacache uh, data on the edge and it's now in private beta. This is a premium feature that we're launching to our users and we've had some inquiries already 
and um, it's it's a big milestone for our team, both in in terms of a, a big feature launch, but also the first uh, first monetization feature that we'll be charging for. Um, so uh, looking forward to seeing where that goes. Uh, we also met in Miami for a few days earlier this month. Uh, a lot of productive hacking. We have videos demoing these hacks. So ping me if you're interested in seeing them. Alan also uh, posted them in lobby uh, maybe two weeks ago or so. Uh, lots of good team discussions and good food. Uh, so it was great to see everyone in person. You can see some photos of us on our team activity to the right. Uh, but unfortunately, most of the team did get COVID in Miami. So, and literally most of the team, almost all the team got COVID. So if everyone, please do be careful out there perhaps if you are uh, visiting Florida, especially. Rough. Well, hopefully everyone is feeling better. Um, Jacob, Bedrock. Yes, so Bedrock, lots going on. Uh, Project Lightning has moved on to doing an overhaul of GraphSync V, or not GraphSync, sorry, GoData Transfer V2. Um, and so the team's been working on that. That's going to lay a lot of the foundation to make the next work that we're looking at for both retrieval from storage providers as well as interop much better to work with. And you heard some of the IPLD Prime updates from Rod earlier. This is integrated in there, so there's a lot of good stuff going on. Um, so hoping to see that out in the next couple of weeks um, on store the index uh, teams aiming to have ingest all the NFT storage into the production indexer um, that we're running at CIA contact by end of week. And then also working with uh, Ken labs to get a short block cash of advertisements in place. And this is going to let us sync now that we have two indexers. Ken labs is running one. We're running one on bedrock or on the bedrock team. We want to make sure that those are in sync. And so we're adding more of that, you know, distribution to the network more than just PL running indexers because hey, distributed networks. Um, and so also on the boost side of things, we are releasing the RC. We've already could attack for that. We're going to announce that on Monday. So we get uh, RC testing going, and then we will be releasing that to production two weeks later. So we're going to start our, our ramp up with lots of blog posts and stuff. So you can see more information about boosts coming soon. And then the team is already starting to look at uh, what the roadmap looks like for scaling. So we've been talking with storage providers on how they are going to scale up to enterprise level needs, because we really want to hit this like goal of five petabytes per day of onboarding in Q3. And so we want to make sure that we're supporting that with storage providers. On reputation side of things, uh, in the next couple of weeks, we're working at getting per provider insights into bandwidth across providers, retrieval limits that they have in place, um, and then aggregations of their deal success and failure rates. This is going to help us better inform what we're looking at for incentive structures for retrieval as well as just general metrics across the network. So that's going to be super helpful. Uh, hopefully, we'll see that um, sometime in June. And then on the uh, KPI side of things, yeah, sort of the index, we're almost approaching 9 billion CIDs ingested, which is super awesome. Um, and we're almost at 90 storage providers who are currently indexing, uh, which is great. And on auto retrieve, so we launched auto retrieve dashboard. This is really, really helpful for us moving into the retrieval side of things and getting a better lay of the land for the network. I think over the past seven days, we've averaged about 20 retrieval requests per second. And so this is the bridge Molly mentioned earlier that's kind of translating between IPFS requests and Filecoin requests. And so what the team is working on is pulling a lot of these events that come in through the retrieval pipeline. And so that we can then better understand where, where are failures happening on the network. And so we can now in, like spend more time focusing on improving that. So as work like retrieval markets and interop scales up in the future, we'll be able to better support that from the storage provider layer. So very excited about a lot of that. And then for some of the gaps that we're looking at in the future, one of the things that we're hoping to leverage Boost for is as we get more rollout is getting opt-in metrics for storage deals. Because while we've ramped up retrieval, we don't have good insight into like high throughput on storage deals. And so we're going to be working with uh, working with storage providers to better understand like how we can get them to opt into these metrics so we can gather more and more information from the storage side of things to improve metrics there. Go ahead. Thanks. Woohoo. Over to Joao for data programs. All right, hello everybody. I'm Joan representing Data Programs here to talk about some updates. So first and foremost, we're focused on uh, systematically addressing some of the choke points in the client onboarding experience. So focused on improving over the wire bandwidth by exploring BGP. Um, so you know, massively increasing the size and volume of our pipes uh, and also incre and looking at off the wire solutions. So you know, using sneaker nets, uh, you know, shipping it, hard drives to ensure that people don't face um, all these difficulties on getting data onto the network. Deep has been hard at work in implementing Phil Plus V3 for LDNs. 
uh, which should significantly speed up the end-to-end -end LDN um, time to data cap, which is something crucial. If you're a large client, you need to be allocated data cap. We need to make sure that process is as seamless as possible. And we can actually now verify how we're making progress there by referring to that new graph that he shipped it this week. Um, and we're also improving uh, Phil Plus by uh, having a third round of notary elections. We're having 50 plus notaries participating starting next week, which is really great, great news. Um, all this is contributing to a, a really healthy growth in our um, data being onboarded. We see we are currently at 89 PIBs of verified deals from 800 clients at a healthy 8% um, week on week growth. Uh, this is pretty consistent over the last uh, two months or so. Um, over on the client pipeline where solutions architects across PL and Falcoin Foundation and ecosystems are collaborating, where we have 60 uh, PIBs of ongoing, uh, oh, 60 PIBs representing uh, clients who are onboarding their data. And we also have 110 PIBs from clients preparing for their POCs. So also a very healthy uh, pipeline there. Um, a couple of highlights. Uh, the client growth analytics dashboard is now 100% automated. Great news. No more CSVs to get metadata uh, all kind of clean up. Um, Slingshot V2 crossed 40 PIBs of total data onboarded. That's four times the original goal, and it's on its way to the file milestone of 45 petabytes. And finally, Slingshot Evergreen crossed one PIB of data in deals renewed, which is fantastic. A couple of gaps that we are addressing we are finding that there's many opportunities in identifying the use cases for data owners and helping them find the right solution. In other words, we're kind of lumping them into one big bucket. We need to figure out how to refine the onboarding solution for all these different types of data owners representing different uh, complexities in terms of their data volume and technical know-how. Uh, also with Evergreen, we're seeing that the average replication factor is about two. Um, and the max replication per CID is set at 10. So for folks who are interested in ensuring the permanence of open data on Falcoin, please refer to evergreen.falcoin.io and help us increase that replication factor. Finally, coming up next, we have Phil Plus Day posted on June 7th. Uh, really excited about this. Please, please join us if you can uh, to learn more about the latest news, participate in ongoing discussions. Phil Plus is a really major part of data programs and getting verified deals on board. So we'd appreciate and love your collaboration presence there. Thank you so much. Awesome. Over to Alex for Crypto Week on. Yeah, this is Alex. Um, yeah, and uh, just wanted to go over a few of the highlights of the past month. Um, we've increased our hiring pipeline quite a bit. Uh, we've hired five people so far in 2022, and our goal is to hit 10 more. Uh, those are data scientists, software engineers, uh, TPMs, and startup operators. Um, we've reviewed 50 proposed changes to the protocol, um, and we've increased the number of public presentations and publications. Uh, we've done five so far in 2022. You know, as a team, uh, we want to ramp that up to 40 as we continue to uh, create these Crypto Econ Day events. Uh, we've done one so far that we did at the Dev Connect in Amsterdam. Uh, we have three planned now, uh, one for Phil Austin, uh, ETH CC in Paris, and uh, Phil Singapore, and possibly the Korea blockchain event. So we're getting a little system down so that we can kind of present what we're doing and let the public know about crypto econ and continue to build that brand and that hub, knowledge hub there. Um, on the project side, we're working with hierarchical consensus. That's a, something we were working on for weeks, and we're trying to reach consensus with the consensus lab uh, and alignment there. Um, some initial scoping on Saturn. Uh, project Atlas, uh, marrying geospatial data with the Filecoin network. Uh, we've begun a first phase there of ideation of different um, dApps and other applications that we could use. Um, building a research roadmap and an analytics roadmap. Um, and let's see, we have a uh, new hire. We have a uh, couple of offers out and some new hiring theses, theses uh, filed. So uh, we have a lot more candidates in the pipeline. We're being very active in that. Thank you. Awesome. Jumping into our spotlights, Jennifer. I'm just going to use this time like to 
say this effort is actually involve a lot of team, not other than FEM and Lotus team. So just want to give a shout out to everyone there, FEM, Beauty Editor, Lotus, kind of all this. Huge shout out to Travis helping us setting up all these tests so we can ensure like, you know, secure testing and all those things. A lot of efforts going to internal and external audits. Uh, Volker who worked on the IPLD part, make sure we actually use IPLD for going building mind and Kuba on the gas and a lot of like a fussing work Nemo dig on the rust side and the proof things and Eva Dragon on the external audits uh, and also we have external people like uh, Falcon Foundation and Sondex like helping along the way just want to give a shout out on everything for the upcoming upgrade thanks Ali Hey, yeah, I think uh, Jenny and Molly, you've got to most of the technical updates. The M1 is in development freeze, so they're on to mapping milestone two, the big one, programmability. Um, the FEM Early Builders Program is awesome. Uh, we've got about uh, 20 builders and about 10 of them are building tooling and infrastructure. We've just released an RFP, an umbrella RFP for that, and already have two RFPs in, one for a high-level Rust SDK to make it easier for developers in future, and Zondax is building an assembly script SDK. We've got two others in the works, uh, probably like the hard hat of FBM um, from Bloxico, which is really cool. And also uh, one from a tiny go SDK as well, which is a super interesting one. Uh, and Jim Pink's been super active here. If you want to have a look at his little actor playground, he's Dockerized, Kubernetes, everything and put it on observable HQ. So you can kind of play around with a few demos he's made on there for FBM as well. Uh, we got a tweet out as well um, on some more of the things that the uh, people have been doing. I'll just post that in the chat. Thank you. <laughs> Woohoo, Marco. Uh, hello. So this is a spotlight on uh, Consensus Labs Udico Gardens. So Udico is in bot botanics like between lotus and plants, right? So it's a group of to which lotus belongs. And our Udico is a lotus fork in which we basically uh, implement hierarchical consensus if you want to try and play with that this is Udico garden it's a set of scripts that uh, basically uses terraform uh, to deploy Udico test networks on aws and then you can play with uh, whatever we shipped so far which are cross subnet transactions standard mean consensus and basically hierarchical consensus mvp we are getting more people very soon so we have uh, we are going to do long-running tests on long-running deployments and uh, basically at dashboards and monitoring and a few other things. So try it out. Thank you. Woohoo. Adeem. Yeah, me again. There was an implementers day. It was on Friday. It was really good. Um, it was about four and a half hours, eight sessions from a lot of people from different companies. Um, about 50 people who showed up and were watching. A thousand people have looked at the videos so far. Uh, if you missed it out, check out the videos. It's on the IPFS YouTube. There's an IPFS Implementers Discord channel if you build or are interested in building IPFS implementations. And there is a sync every two weeks. It is on the IPFS community calendar. To Google it, you'll find the IPFS community calendar. Um, and a big shout out to Brendan and everybody who, uh, who helped make it happen. It's really exciting and uh, looking forward to seeing this grow. Good. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of CX about the big data exchange um, that is a marketplace for uh, storage providers to bid to store charismatic public data sets. Um, this is a, a kind of like think of the, the benefits of NFT marketplaces for discovery of amazing content, but for storage providers to discover amazing public good data sets um, that they, they want to help store and onboard and replicate uh, across the Filecoin network kind of paves the way for uh, bringing even more great data to the network and an even better onboarding experience for clients with really valuable um, data that, that we want to persist. I think they have successfully closed their first auction at 29 terabytes, uh, closed at 16 fill, paid by a real SP. So uh, awesome to see them hitting that, uh, that thing. Go visit uh, Big D dot exchange uh, to see how you can sell valuable data and how SPs can, can bid for uh, the opportunity to store that in the network. Really, really great to see this happening. Um, go check out, at, uh, the team will be at Phil Austin if you want to, to learn more. On to our deep dives. Um, we'll do these a little quickly, but first, Hannah for data transfer. I'm Hannah from Bedrock, um, and I'm excited to introduce uh, an effort our team is exploring to supercharge the ways we are able to move data around our networks. First of all, I wanna help folks understand what we have today. 
Um, you've probably heard uh, the words BitSwap and GraphSync. I want to talk briefly about what they are and how they're different. Both of these protocols move IPLD data around Lib2P networks. The analogy I've been using to help non-programmers understand is this. BitSwap is roughly designed like BitTorrent, while GraphSync is roughly designed by, uh, like HTTP. That means they shine best in different scenarios. BitSwap, like BitTorrent, is good for moving highly distributed content from many peers where each individual peer might have low bandwidth, like a home computer. GraphSync, like HTTP, functions great for downloading data from high bandwidth servers like storage providers. Um, the other big difference between the protocols is a historical artifact of how they were built. Um, BitSwap is the bread and butter of IPFS, while GraphSync was written in the course of Filecoin development. This has led to some big difference in the implementations we produce. These aren't differences that are inherent to the protocol, but they're nonetheless quite significant. GoGraphSync supports layers for payments and authorization, while Go GoBitSwap keeps everything free. And not only that, but GoGraphSync provides multiple layers of control to our operators, while GoBitSwap has very little, has a lot less configurability. This has led uh, in newer situations to a kind of a difficult trade-off. Um, we are starting to see in like retrieval markets, um, it would be nice to be able to reach e for either protocol without having to think about what is and isn't supported in terms of things like payments and authorizations. It's a tough trade-off right now. Retrieval markets, for example, needs multi-peer transfers, but also they're going to need payments eventually. What do they use? Right. And this is what Project Thunder is trying to answer. The why not both? <laughs> um, we want to make each project protocol more powerful and flexible. So it isn't really a choice. I shouldn't have to say if I build for Filecoin, I use GrassLink. If I build for IPFS, I'm kind of stuck on BitSwap. Or if I use BitSwap, I can't use have payments. The auto retrieve project you'll hear about next is great for bridging IPFS and Filecoin, but in a long term, one shouldn't need to run a server to translate transfer protocols. And it's not just about making these choices easier. We can actually use one protocol to fill in the gaps with the other. BitSwap lags behind BitTorrent in performance sometimes because BitTorrent starts with more information at the start about the structure of data you're downloading. So what if GraphSync could be used to quickly discover that information? How much faster could BitSwap be? These are the kinds of questions we're aiming to answer. So anyway, how are we gonna do all this? Um, well, this is what you're going to get for the five minute version. Uh, no, seriously, I tried to make like a super simple architectural guide and no matter how much I cut it down, the answer will be unsatisfactory unless I'm taking the other geek dives uh, time and I'm not going to do that. That's not what you do to teammates. Suffice to say, it's complicated. In terms of what we're doing right now, um, uh, we have two protocols and several layers of payments that only work with GrassSync. In our current work, uh, Bedrock is re-architecting the higher level layers to be full, fully protocol neutral, while IPFS stewards are building the hooks in BitSwap to make it possible to support payments. This is complicated, slow work, but you will see, hopefully, a grow uh, re-architected GoData transfer V2, um, in, it says in a month or so, but I just heard two weeks. So in two weeks, it will be here. But here's a ton of more information. Um, you can read the detailed project proposal and roadmap. It proposed extensions to Dick BitSwap. Watch a video on how we're re-architecting Go Data Transfer. And you can also follow progress at hashtag data transfer in interop on Phil Slack. Um, and you can check the slides to dig into these. I might maybe do a, a, a like a, a deeper dive for programmers at some point. One last thing. Um, we may not get this work done super soon. Protocol, these kinds of protocol changes are really hard. They're always hard every time we do them. Um, they're long-term investments and they don't always have super visible win like immediate wins, but they have very big long-term wins. So our team, it's possible we may need to get reallocated at some point for immediate priorities, but my hope is we're gonna get there and that we're gonna invest as an organization in this kind of low-level work to unlock these key long-term benefits for our network. That's all. Awesome, thank you so much, Hannah. Uh, on to Will for auto retrieve. So auto retrieve, we've mentioned a couple times. This is one of the stop gaps that we're putting in place, uh, so that in the short term, we can make content that's in Filecoin accessible to IPFS, to gateways, uh, and just more generally um, bridge some of the protocol uh, gaps that we've got at the moment. It also serves a secondary purpose, which is it gives us a lot more view into the state of retrievals uh, and lets us uh, work with data programs uh, to to sort of help. Uh, set up the right incentives to encourage storage providers to ramp up on their retrieval bandwidth and their infrastructure so that they can serve the amounts of retrievals that we're expecting 
to keep growing. So this is running. Uh, it, we've, we've recently switched it to a Kubernetes deployment that we can keep running pretty stably. Um, we're working through some ongoing resource management uh, stuff so that uh, it not only is running, but also serving at high quality. You can see some gaps in the success failure rate where it runs out of memory currently. Um, all this work is thanks to Elijah on the outer core team and Kyle on the bedrock team. But more generally, what this is going to mean is that when you go to IPFS.io, uh, what will happen is that will uh, go back to the big IPFS node that is that gateway. It will be peered. And so it's bit swap requests. We'll talk to its peers. And one of the peers will be this auto retrieve node, which looks like an IPFS node um, that is just sort of in the IPFS network. Um, right now, uh, you need to be peered. Um, the, the, what that means is it's serving currently um, IPFS nodes that are in the DHT server uh, ring because it automatically connects to them. Um, but if you're another IPFS client, you're not getting the full benefit quite yet because you won't necessarily be connected. Those bits off requests um, will then be seen by auto retrieve who will ask the store the index indexing node for those SIDs. When those SIDs are found from a storage provider uh, on Filecoin, it will then make a graph sync request to pull that content locally into its own cache. And then we'll say that it has those blocks um, and be able to respond to them over bits one. Uh, so it acts like a block cache. It keeps a, a relatively large um, order of tens to hundreds of gigs of blocks that it knows about uh, in cache that it's pulled from storage providers. Um, but the thought is that these are transient. We can eventually have them running in the same regions as gateway instances uh, and just generally use this as a short term over the next month's uh, way to bridge uh, until we get some vertical upgrades. Uh, I will leave it there. Uh, there's an auto retrieve channel in Falcon Slack. Awesome, thank you so much. And on to Jennifer for Lotus. A lot of you may know since PLV7, the huge big Falcon team has getting, you know, decoupled to a lot of like smaller teams. And over the time uh, we have Byrox working on market problems. Uh, there will be tickets, I swear. Uh, the Lotus team has tried to find our own like definition, our own entity in the whole Falcon community and ecosystem team. So that's what we are sharing here today with you, like we will, our thinking is. Uh, on the left side, as you can see, we're a small team still. We have eight, eight folks with four engineers and four uh, technical support engineers that have been super helpful for a lot of the things. Uh, our mission and scope first is like, we serve Filecoin network. Uh, we ship the protocol along with other implementation and teams. We want to make sure all the node operators can run a Lotus a node and talk to the network, talk to the chain, building their application. Developers is a huge, huge focus uh, for our like user group. Uh, as you may already know, Lotus is slowly stepping back from the market development. However, we want to be able to, to enable folks like Baroque engineers to build uh, market protocols on top of Lotus. Uh, and also when the FEM is coming, we want to make sure that developers can also have a very good uh, uh, experience, basically like on um, block enable a lot of use case on top of Falcoin. That's why we think the more is a super important community that Lotus should like focus on. The other one, we don't have to, to say storage providers. We need them to get like, you know, uh, all these uh, data into the network. Uh, and also like user support. We want to make sure that, you know, we maintain a good open source like community uh, and help us further build the Falcoin network. And next slide, please. So that's our mission scope. And how do we ship all these things? So we have a bunch of things like Lotus trying to do. Uh, so most of you will be curious. I feel like uh, the P2P IPLD we have been, uh, and proof team, we have been working uh, very closely to get their stack also shipped in Lotus as we are a user of uh, their tech. So how Lotus does things today is like we ship monthly feature releases, which always is an optional release. Uh, it includes a lot of like shiny things, new features. We are still like shipping on like a go few market that kind of works behalf, like all those shiny things going into that. But mostly we are focused on maintenance a lot. We spend a lot of time to do bug fixes, like pay off the uh, tech debt just to make sure our user can be happy they and use the Lotus in their production line stably. And we also have mandatory release, which is for network upgrade. Those are like less, you know, stable on the timeline because like a wire file needs an upgrade. We will do the same. 
uh, as you can see here in the screenshot, we have we haven't been missing a monthly feature release uh, for I would say eight months now. Even when we ship like mandatory network upgrade release, we also make sure we keep the uh, feature releases going just to make sure all the development in master is uh, is shipped. So how can we get the things developed and like you know coordinate into these releases? So we have a, a set of like processes. So first to start with, we start our day in the team with cat and memes, as you already know. Uh, you can see here, these are our Lotus cat. And we also have memes going on. So to make our life a little bit more fun, get into the real work. So a lot of time that yes, our technical support engineering team is doing is to make sure that we charge the incoming issues in GitHub or like in Slack or GitHub discussion within 48 hours. So the dev team knows the immediate thing that needs to be looked at to make sure nothing broke and also to feed into our backlog of the things. Uh, next slide, please. There are things that it's like, oh my God, you have to fix that immediately. Otherwise, Falcon network may die. But a lot of the other things will be going into the Lotus backlog. So basically our TS team TSE team will be putting out this like weekly charge summary, which feed into our spring planning. Um, before I get into the spring planning, I do want to say another thing we do is like we do culture project backlog charge prioritization and roadmap planning. Because like Lotus is still trying to, it's still kind of like a, a stakeholder of the core development of the Falcon network. And because we are within PLN, working closely with a lot of other teams like protocol. Opportunity team, CLL, consensus lab, DRAN team, we kind of know more like what's coming, like, you know, uh, in the six months or a year basis. And that's why we try to keep everything in our backlog just, just to keep everyone informed, including the Falcon Foundation and other, uh, other core devs. So we do a quarterly project back, uh, backlog charge just to help us understanding what's need to be in the next network upgrade and start planning. Uh, so for that, uh, so that's a cross we say, and we also within the Lotus and uh, Lotus team, we have our bi-weekly thinking section. So this is a time we, you know, a lot of other teams is doing amazing work in the ecosystem. It's hard to keep up. So this is our chance to catch up with the world and, you know, to, just like to understand like what may be ready to come to us and have we have to be the shipping ship of their work. Uh, so this is the part we trying to understand the problem needs to be solved and learn a lot of the new work that other people are doing, like DRAM, time encryption, or like sharding and all those things. After all this planning and like uh, backlog feeding, we do our monthly spring planning. Uh, so basically this is like a week before the before the code freeze, we will pick up what are we going to ship for the next week. We will make sure that we have bug to, uh, to be analysis, uh, implementing some like low hanging fruit features and implementing the projects that's in our roadmap. Uh, next slide. We're almost done. Uh, and so those are all the development work, work we are trying to do. Uh, and on on like community engagement and project management, we also have weekly community updates that's shared in Phil Lotus announcement channel. Uh, I will suggest you, uh, I will like recommend you to, to join that channel to get the timely updates from our team. Uh, we are also generating library reports just to inform you uh, all the feedbacks we're getting from the Filecoin community in general, what their pain points are what are the use case new use cases people are looking forward to so that we can unblock them so like as you already know we always have a lot of things going on however we do want to say like we welcome all the incoming requests to get into our backlog we cannot guarantee when we can get into that but we commit that we will you know eventually go through them uh, one by one by by with you guys or like with grants or external teams so you can be super helpful if you give us precise ask on like the problem and the issue and what the user story and what the pain points is are like those can help us prioritize all these requests and you are running a new project, for example, or a program for like Evergreen or Slingshot, you need our support to like, you know, just to like set a good foundation of the program. Let us know if you give us like one to, two, one to three months of like 
data, we probably can find time to work with you and be responsive with your participants. The other thing we want to do is like onboarding and support the open source co uh, contributors. Uh, so if you know any dev team that can be good for us to collaborate, please let us know. We want to establish those uh, relationships. Yes, said a lot of things. So how can you actually find us? Uh, again, uh, create the issue is always the way to go. Lotus is our uh, GitHub repository, or you can go in, go to the built-in actor where one of the co-maintainer of that as well. We are very responsive in the public field Lotus dev channel, even more responsive than the DMs. Uh, but if you want to reach out to our team, uh, like having a meeting, have a have a talk or whatever, you can reach out to me in DM as well at Jenny Juju. But again, I check the public channel more often. We do have office hours, but honestly, just join the field office, most of our, our engineers just like, love hanging out there. So like, if you want to talk to us, join the office. Uh, everything I just presented you, you're seeing the public Notion page. There's a link there. You can see our roadmap, our release schedule, our mission and scope, everything there. And we started our Twitter account early this year, and we started to trying to build our own profile there. So followers and likes are highly appreciated. Um, that's that. Awesome. Thank you so much. And that is it for our agenda today. So um, everyone have a wonderful rest of May. And thank you to all of our presenters for that deep dive.